At the University of Lund in Sweden, zoologist Dan Erik Nilsson has developed models to show how a primitive eye spot could evolve through intermediate stages to become a complex human-like eye in less than half a million years. Yeah, I've been interested in eye evolution for a long time. I mean, in particular, I've been interested in the question of how long time it would take for an eye to evolve. Nielsen envisioned a sequence of stages by which a flat patch of light-sensitive cells on an animal's skin could evolve into a camera-type eye. As a first step, nature would favor any changes that made the flat patch more cup-like. As soon as you've created even the slightest depression in the center, it means that the, the um, edges of the cup will actually shade light from parts of the environment. And, of course, all the light-sensitive cells in this little cup, they won't measure light in exactly the same direction. So already this cup has some pictorial information. Another model demonstrates what a primitive cup eye can do. The brightly lighted skulls cast an image onto a translucent screen Nielsen installs at the back of the cup to act like a retina. But the image is not at all well defined. The cup eye can do little more than detect movement. This kind of eye can be found in nature today, in flatworms. Their eyes evolved no further. In their environment, that's all they needed. But if the animals need to move faster or evolve to become fast predators or to see other fast predators, then the construction needs to be improved. And one way of doing that is to constrict the opening to make it smaller. That's just what happened to creatures like the chambered nautilus. Over thousands of generations, natural selection favored those with slightly more constricted eye openings, which focus light more sharply. This worked well, up to a point. Since this strategy of making a sharp image also has the drawback of creating a very dim image, it's not very popular in the animal kingdom. And uh, there is an alternative solution which is, has become very popular in the animal kingdom, the solution that we use in our own eyes, and that is to put in a lens. Nielsen's model lens uses two thin layers of clear plastic. He can inject water in between them to make the plastic windows bulge out like a convex lens. This mimics what natural selection might have done over a few hundred thousand generations, favoring animals with a rounded, transparent layer in their eyes that cause light to be focused more sharply on the retina. So we can make it gradually from no lens at all and just continue to inject more water, making the lenses bulge more and more and the image becomes gradually sharper and sharper. So we can go all the way gradually in very small steps from a simple uh, pigment cup eye, which has barely got the ability to determine the direction of a light source, all the way to a complete camera type eye of the same type as we have ourselves. And that is really exactly the way eye evolution must proceed. The extreme complexity of the eye left Darwin in a cold sweat, he wrote to a friend. But still, he was convinced that an eye could be formed by natural selection. He later wrote that eyes must have evolved by numerous gradations from an imperfect and simple eye to one perfect and complex, with each grade being useful to its possessor. Nature, unaided by a designer, could produce an organ of seemingly miraculous complexity. Whoa! 
Oh, it's Smurf. <sighs> Annie, come and look. <sighs> when I first started looking, I thought lots of the barnacles had tiny parasites. That's an animal or plant that lives on another animal or plant, gets its food from it, like mistletoe on an apple tree. But they're not. Do you know what they are? No. They're little, tiny husbands. The females carry little, tiny males around with them, clinging to their skirt tails. Just like you and Mama. <laughs> Just like me and Mama. I think it's the most interesting barnacle in the whole wide world. What do you think we should call it? Barnabas. Barnabas, for short. Barney <laughs> The tiny parasitic males are rudimentary in a way that I believe can hardly be equaled in the whole of the animal kingdom. They have no mouth or stomach. They are really little more than a tiny head atop an enormous coiled penis. A bit like me, really. Apart from the bit about the mouth and the stomach. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> nothing! Nothing! Charles! Charles, are you all right? Charles! Erasmus, take him home. Why must you work so hard at your horrid little mollusks? Oh, they're not horrid little mollusks. They're horrid little crustaceans. And I have horrid pigeons and horrid worms, too. They're providing the evidence I need for my theory. Oh. I don't have the right to publish the idea unless I have the evidence. We must do something about you. Your stomach condition is nervous in origin. Brought on as a result of excessive mental exertion. Cold water is used to stimulate the circulation and draw the blood supply away from the inflamed nerves of the stomach. No sugar, no salt, no bacon, no alcohol, no tobacco. In fact, Anything at all that's good is forbidden. <laughs> I don't know how or why, but I feel so much better. <laughs> I look around me, and I don't care two hoots how any of this came to be created. <laughs> Children, last one back to the house is a rice pudding. <laughs> Come on, William, you're last. Come on, run! Quick, quick, quick! Come on, Etty! Come on, <laughs> oh. Annie! Annie, you won! <laughs> Come here, my darling! Oh. <laughs> Oh, Annie, my dear and good child. <laughs> Come on, Come on darling. Oh, 